we're going to keep going with these Halloween themed uh, film reviews. This time we're talking about Dracula, the 1931 version. Let's do it. I realized recently I had never watched this film all the way through from beginning to end. And I would watched, I tried to watch Frankenstein one year. I want to say last year, maybe the year before that. And I fell asleep. You know, I tried to, I watched The Mummy and that was good. I really liked that movie. That was a good movie. And I realized one, one night I was like, you know what? I haven't watched Dracula. Let me just sit down and watch this movie. So I watched it and I fell asleep. <laughs> I start I started watching it and I fell asleep. Woke up a couple hours later and then put it back on and finished it. And I enjoyed it very much. I liked a lot about it. So man, I'm always amazed watching movies from old Hollywood. And uh it's particularly interesting, I think, um talking about this movie after just talking about Pearl not long ago and the old school techniques and old school sort of spirit used in that movie. Now watching a, a, a true old school movie made with the technological advancements in film uh, at the time. And it still holds up. It still holds up. I, I found out there's a Spanish version. Uh, I didn't know this. And I'm planning on watching that. I'll plan uh, at some point because my understanding is that it's technically better than the U.S. original one. And I think I want to watch that for myself and be the judge. But what I saw of the American original was pretty good. Actually, you know what? I think probably you really what you what you really get. This movie really is um, it's a testament to Bela Lugosi's uh, presence. The man is, I, and it makes me want to, I I want to see, I don't know, I doubt that there's any video or any film footage of the Broadway play version of of, of Dracula that was, um, that he was also starred in, which I didn't know. I didn't know that. Um, but the man is like, you can, you see why he's, well, at least his, his version of Dracula is so iconic and how that is what every other, you know, in some form, every version of Dracula draws from, uh, almost every version draws from what Lugosi uh, brought to the table. He doesn't have to overact, you know, he doesn't have to do, he's, what he, and granted, movies during that time seemed to be, there was a lot of stuff, that was just, there was a way of acting, that's how it was. But I think if you look at all the actors in the movie, Bela Lugosi is like the powerhouse. He's like the standout of this film. I think next to uh, Van Helsing, the actor who plays Van Helsing, Edward Van Sloan, he is equally uh, fantastic. And I think you need an actor of his caliber to go toe-to-toe with uh, Lugosi because uh, it works. I liked the practical effects of stuff. It's cool, even though it's primitive to what happens now in filmmaking. But there's something about the magic of it. You can imagine being a kid watching the movie during that time in the early 1930s and being taken with what you see on screen. Heck, I, you know, I was taken with it now. It, I mean, it still, it still works. It's like, you know, it's not that different than watching a play on stage where if you see, like, water, for instance, and you know there are people moving the waves to make it look like water, but you are swept up in the the magic of what's being conveyed to you. You buy it, even though you know it's fake water. It's like paper or whatever it is. But how all the elements come together with the lighting, the stage direction, the blocking, all of that make it feel real in a sense. And I think the same is true for these old movies. You know there's stuff that's practically done uh, and yet there's still some some magic to it because you don't know exactly how everything is done I you know I <laughs> but you know it's not they didn't use computer generated stuff and I think even without computer generated imagery 
it is awesome. It still it still works. And I think a good story is a good story. And I think what you have is a solid uh, story about, you know, evil. And you got uh, a hero in Van Helsing who is putting the pieces together quickly and, and, and figuring things out. And he's able to, you know, get to the bottom of what's going on. The other thing that's really serious about this movie is the fact that there is little music. Like stuff happens and there's zero music. That makes it extra serious. It's almost like it's like it's real. And I think I read something. No, I watched something. I watched a documentary recently about the old Universal monsters. Not just those movies, but other movies, older horror movies, sort of in the 19, early 1920s, 1930s. And then, um, uh, and maybe earlier. And what, what came, what was cool, what stuck with me, uh, had a lot to do with um, the lack of music and how that affected audiences during that time. Uh, I didn't, I completely, I didn't think about it. But I'm going, oh, if you watched silent films in those days, like I did, I didn't. But I'll tell you what I did do. So I used to cover um, the Cinequest Film Festival in San Jose. Um, every year, they do a uh, one of the Fridays. They do a 1920s night, so where they they play silent films at the old California Theater downtown, and it was the the California Theater that was built and opened in 1926-27, and that's where people went. One of the places people went in San Jose to see uh, movies, and they were still silent pictures at that time. And so I go, you know, I go every year. Um, I didn't go to this last year, but I go to the, to that 1920s night, and it's cool to see people dressed up in their, you know, 1920s, 1930s garb to see black and white silent films. When you go into the theater, and, um, you know, you have the guy playing on the organ. He's down there playing the music and stuff, as they would have done during during that time in the 1920s, 1910s, 1920s. Uh, to watch movies, you have the band or, or one person playing the 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 Wolitzer, how, w- w- Wolitzer, whatever, the organ uh, instrument there. And they put these shows on as if you are in the mid-1920s watching films. So if I put myself in that mindset, they're already there, you, you're you placed in the time and, pl- and, and space of the mid-1920s where you have live music being played to the images on the screen. So if I'm watching Dracula... Um, without that music, it's supremely unsettling, and which is what I did when I watched it. It was you're just seeing you seeing things happen, and it 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 uh, it's there's something about seeing images on the screen and actions happen and dialogue being being um, uh, volleyed back and forth uh, between characters without music that just makes it feel less like a movie and much more um, real. That's what I felt. There's some music, but there's not a lot. And I'll tell you what, so I, one of the best sequences in the film is, there's two of them. I think probably the strongest, though, like the, the number one sequence is probably the first time you see Dracula. The coffin opens up and he rises out of the coffin, which you don't see, but what you do see, the camera pans over to him and he's already upstanding. He's such an imposing figure. The camera pulls into him as he's, you know, he's just standing there. Just And they cut to a close-up. You see his features. It's an amazing introduction. When you see Dracula, it's, you, you feel it. I was like, whoa, that's an intro right there. That's like a serious. <laughs> the other thing I appreciated is how when Van Helsing is introduced, you know, you see him tinkering and doing like sciencey stuff. Um, and you know immediately this guy is is serious. He's not a throwaway character. He's not a side character. He holds just as much weight as Dracula. This is the guy that's going to give Dracula most of his problems in the film. And um, and you know right away, ooh, that, that's kind of cool. And I think it's cool when how older movies did it. They don't do it like that today when you have characters introduced. It's just a, a product of like how um, filmmaking is done today. But I thought that was pretty awesome. The other thing that is cool, I think, about how movies were made back then is 
whatever limits they had, they used to their advantage. And I don't know if it was conscious, but that, that's just that's just what it was. Whatever their limits were, they weren't barriers to telling a good story. I'll give you an example. So every time Dracula attacks someone, you never actually see the attack. Like, if that movie's made today, you're going to see the attack. You're going to see him get all up in somebody's grill. You're going to see him bite somebody. You're going to see blood trickling. You're going to see all the stuff. This movie, you don't get any of that. And I think there's something that's even almost more effective. The fact that you don't see the bite mark. You never see bite marks. You hear people talking about them. You never see blood. You never see it, any of that. But it's still um, effective. It works. Because what you, the result is you want to know this guy's threatening and he's jacking people up. And that's what you, you get that. And that's all you really need. You don't have to show a whole bunch of stuff. And this actually says a lot about um, restraint. When filmmakers today make pictures that exercise restraint where you don't see a whole bunch of stuff, where the absence of stuff actually makes it feel more palpable because you're imagining the stuff. And I think that's the same type of thing you get with Dracula. When you know he's attacking somebody, he's going to go in and he's very deliberate with how he does that. Movies today, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't allow... It just They just wouldn't. And, and part of that is just like the unless you made the movie like that and audiences just kind of have to deal with it. But back then, you know, there was space for... You know, Lugosi took time to get up in there and jack somebody up. It wasn't like he swooped in and jack somebody like they did. That's what you would do now. But you see him... It's the it's the buildup, which makes it. It just feels more more rich in that way. He's gonna look at the victim, potential before he attacks someone. You watch the victim. He gets his hands ready, and then he deliberately slowly moves in for the kill. And it's almost like uh, it makes it actually even more feel more. Um, there's a sensuality I think in that. Like he's almost like uh, appraising you know some meat or something. Or some food, some dish he's going to devour. Uh, and he's going to take his time and savor whatever is in front of him. That's what it, Because the person is out. They're asleep or whatever it is. They're jacked up. They're knocked out. He can pretty much have... He can do whatever he wants. And there's something about seeing it done that way than you see in later adaptations of Dracula. That is... The, um, it's much more uh, dramatic and much more in your face. And... Um, not that those are bad that's just that's just a product of sort of the evolution of how the films are made and all of that type of stuff and what audiences how audience tastes have shifted and all of that but I think there's something to be said for the way old movies do stuff like this too uh, and I think there's still a place for that and it still it works it still works that said some of the um, tick marks <laughs> well, some of the things, I mean, uh, this film is unintentionally funny, too, at times. And I think, um, but, well, that's part of the charm of it, though, because it's, you know, they're older films. Uh, the way things are done, too, uh, even though it, does, it holds up in the horror uh, suspense department, um, there are parts of it that are uh, because of just how our tastes are today uh, makes it funny. And like the multiple uses of the close-ups of Lugosi's uh, features. Um, it's intense. You know he's serious. And you know he's taking it seriously. Uh, and, but some of it is, is still funny too to see his face do like this and then how he's lit. Which is cool though. The effect of that is cool. How he's lit. How his eyes are showing. It, yeah, it's really well done. Some of the practical effects, while they work, uh, it is funny to see like a puppet uh, like, you know, fake bats or fake spiders um, moving and doing what they're doing. Um, you do chuckle like, ah, that's funny. <laughs> um, but, you know, that said, that's just what it is. Yeah, that's that's what they that's what they had. That's what they had access to. Something else that came up for me um, during my second viewing, I watched the film two times in the last couple of days. Uh, and that was the notion of sex 
and horror and how the two I didn't realize if you go back far enough you can see how far they're linked in a way where sensuality sexuality is linked to sinful behavior and um it's negative it's um you know it is grounds for being uh for punishment and how dracula represents the allure of sensuality he's attacking these women who are by all accounts as far as we know pure they are um innocent women and you know they are wholesome women and yet when he gets a hold of them you know they become his slaves they are now unchained from social norms social you know they don't have to conf- they're not conforming to social uh, uh constructs anymore it's whatever he wants that's what you're about to do and what's cool i liked how well what's cool about how it's portrayed is how in the film anyway is how dracula is communicating things sometimes without even saying anything that's serious but there's a deeper conversation about dracula as a man taking something he's taking purity taking the sort of chastity innocence away from these women and um the ways in which that's displayed in this film is uh there's something about it that is not you know it's obviously not like how it would be in a in a later film that it might might be a lot more rough more violent you know and much more uh obvious of like a depiction of uh, a kind of rape which it, it frankly is kind of like a a kind of rape that um Dracula is engaging in that's just something that hit me like sort of when I thought more deeply about it and these things are not meant to be sort of intellectualized all the time these are just you know, like they're fun films whatever but that said um that's kind of hard to to not do if you think a lot about a lot of stuff like me <laughs> so so that's what's happening that's what this is about and then the other thing too is what I thought was interesting speaking of how Dracula is attacking mostly women I mean, with the exception of Renfield, he's the only man I think that uh, was attacked. And and frankly, Van Helsing was 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 about to be jacked up too. He was he was on he was on the list. Um, so it isn't as though there is uh, he's discriminating against uh, um, men and women. He's not. But I just find it interesting that most of his, his proper victims outside of Renfield were women. And also, you know, I think there's a, there's a mention of, in the film that children are attacked too. But the children are attacked by by um, one of the women who was attacked by Dracula. And it's interesting just to think about that. But my next thought was it went to Dracula's wives, who we see it maybe two times in the film. And one question that came up for me was like, what the heck, what happened to them? Um, you know, if, if Dracula doesn't make it through the story, uh, where are his wives? Did they survive? And it's almost like, dang, man, are people still getting messed up because his wives are still at large or maybe they're not because he's not around, you know, if you've seen the movie, you know, Dracula doesn't make it out of the story. So, um, if he's not around to control them, are they free to just roam, you know, uh, or what are they, are they attacking people of their own volition or what? I, you know, I don't know. It's one of the questions that came up for me, but, um, yeah, this is cool. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's aside from that, it's a fun movie. Um, like I said, oh, my favorite scene, I guess I say this, and I think I'm going to cut it off, but I'm going to say this. <laughs> my favorite scene in the film <laughs> is, it's just after Van Helsing has discovered that Dracula is a vampire. And he's expressed this to the different people in the room with him. Dracula leaves, but then at some point he comes back. And he's trying to tell Van, H- Van Helsing that he is, uh, you know, now that you know who I am, what I what, what I am, you got to get out of here. And Van Helsing was like, nah, I think I'm going to stay. You know, I think I'm going to hang around for a little bit and try to stop you from hurting people. And so that exchange is tight, right? I think the writing in that scene is cool. Um, 
even for the time it feels like you you don't you don't you're not um it's like you know like shakespeare or anything like you know when there's confrontation and stuff when you're like oh it's gonna get good this is really good you're you're in it no matter what the language is no matter what how it's spoken it could be broken english it could be a whole other language or whatever it is um the energy of it is palpable so this is the first time that the two of them are confronted they're confronting each other with no pretense right each of them know what time it is now now we're about to get it's this is it's real now <laughs> and to see them communicate i must have watched that scene just last night i watched that I must i must have watched that sequence 10 times just no lie i just went on youtube and watched how they talk to each other it's cool but the tightest thing about it is how dracula is about to attack van helsing and he's like he reaches into his, you know he reaches into his pocket and he's like yo what is that wolf pain <laughs> And the way Van Helsing responds, like he was so confident, and he busted out the cross, and it was like, "Oh shoot, that's you're in trouble." <laughs> now, and then he, of course, Dracula has to flee at the sign of the cross. It's no good for him. Um, but what I want to highlight about that is understand how. Look, there's no special effects, right? There's no flashing lights, no digital effects, no music. It's just mano a mano, right? These two dudes who are like sound, the, the presence is, is there. And it's clear there is no, you know, when they first met, there was like some, they were all polite. Oh, this is Dracula. This is Van Helsing. And they're like bowing to each other. Very old fashioned, very classic, very um, classy, right? When Dracula returns, None of that is there. I mean, they're still, they're st- they're talking cordially, whatever it is, but it's clear that the that there is no um, you know. I don't have to be I don't have to be polite to you, but they are being you know they're they're speaking plainly, they're not being jerks to each other, but both people know that now the game is on, and this is not a joke. <laughs> Take that for what you will. That's my probably my favorite scene in the whole movie. And again, I've watched that 50 billion times. I'm, in fact, after I shoot this video, I'm about to go back and watch it again, just because I, I was I'm so taken with that sequence, and I feel like it's um it's the it, it just it it just hits. There's an electricity in that scene, and there is a um a a power in that scene. The 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 chemistry between them is strong, and I think man, they were right. Filmmakers were right to keep Lugosi. Although I understand that they didn't want him. I think people who um, uh, were behind the production of the film didn't want Lugosi. Or the guy, uh, um, I, I, don't know, I don't know if it's true for um, Van Helsing, the actor for Van Helsing. But man, they, they made a good choice keeping both of those actors from the Broadway production. Oh, the last thing I want to talk about is the, um, the miniature effects. There's a sequence um, in the first act of the, of the film where uh, Renfield and Dracula are traveling from Transylvania to London uh, uh, by ship. And you know the boat is a miniature, probably. There's a lot of water effects and, different, and there's water there. And, but they, there's a couple parts of that sequence where there's huge like, like waves of water coming onto the ship and it's intercut with the ship on, on the water. And I don't know. It's really, it's really cool. Again, it's like the like a, watching a play on stage, but you, there's real water in there somewhere. There's real water on the screen. There's real, there's a boat moving around all crazy and doing stuff. And and it, they cut away to to guys on on deck trying to negotiate the boat and make it work. That's a, it's it's a it's cool. It's a cool sequence. I really I, again I don't know how the heck they did it and how they they lit it in a way. It looks it looks cool. Uh, I'm with it. I can. I'm with it all the way. Um, and following that sequence, there is a another sequence where there's a voiceover, and you don't see bodies. You see a shadow of somebody who's like, you know, the captain at the at the um, at the wheel. And again, that's cool that you don't see bodies. You hear them talking about it. And this is the kind of stuff I think that's interesting. You know, again, you don't see this in movies today. 
um, they cut to those newspaper, newspaper clippings and stuff. Someone had to make those newspaper clippings. <laughs> and just the production design is kind of cool. I like those news, news, the newspaper sequence. That, that's tight. Little things like that really help um, make the movie uh, just that, little, that, that much more special. So if you haven't seen Dracula recently, give it a watch. Um, because, you know, and it, you might be bored. You know, you, look, if I'm being honest, you might find yourself falling asleep, you know. <laughs> but if you can make it through, push yourself through. It's not that long. It's like an hour and 15 minutes or something like that. If you can push through, um, you might find it to be a fun experience this Halloween season. So, you know, give that a thought. Um, other than that, I think that's going to be it for this review. If you've made it this far, thank you for watching. Um, come on back. We've got a few more reviews, Halloween special themed movies coming up uh, because, you know, we got a couple more days before Halloween. So Halloween movies are in the mix now. So, <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys later.